Uh, hey everyone, my name is Lisa and I'm really happy to welcome all of you today to our first event of the Grand Challenges in Science Lecture Series of the University of Oxford. This is a student-led um, lecture series and I quickly want to introduce all of us. We are all part of the Interdisciplinary Bioscience Doctoral Training Program and we are all in our first year. So today Morgan and I are going to host this event. Um, and the first talk is going to be from Machanta Scallion, who is the CEO of the Asteroid Mining Corporation and who is actually turning 25 today. So a warm happy birthday from all of us. And thank you so much for taking your time to speak to us today. My pleasure. Um, um, I will give like a short introduction about what the speaking series is about. And then Morgan will introduce Mitch a little bit further and um, then Mitch will have his talk. And in the end, you can ask questions. So the Grand Challenges in Science Lecture Series, the title is already kind of giving it away, is focusing on um, answering the questions about the most crucial problems our today's society is facing and how we can tackle them by science. We are focusing on a mostly interdisciplinary approach and we will cover different topics from sustainability to GMOs in the European Union and also their legislation and also how our understanding of um, molecular pathways can lead to a better future. So with that, I want to hand over to Morgan to introduce Mitch. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you again, Mitch, for being here on your birthday and a big happy birthday to you. It's okay, thank you. It's a good way to mark 25 taps in the sun. <laughs> Mitch is the founder and CEO of the Asteroid Mining Corporation Limited, the UK's first space resources and asteroid mining technology company. Uh, Mitch founded the Asteroid Mining Corporation in 2016 after finishing a dissertation on the economic and political benefits of asteroid mining at Liverpool Hope University. Um, the aim of the company is to successfully uh, mine asteroids and establish a sustainable economy in space within the next 50 years. Um, in addition to his role as Chief Executive Officer, Mitch is also a member of the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group and works tirelessly to promote and develop the global asteroid mining community, industry, and a sustainable future in space for the next, um, for humanity's future, basically. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing about your work um, and Thank you for being here today. Oh, my absolute pleasure. It's not every day you get to give a talk for Oxford. <laughs> right, shall I begin then? Yeah. Fantastic. Right, so a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, a pleasure to spend an hour of my birthday with you all as well. Um, so I am Mitch Hunter-Scullion. I'm the CEO and founder of the Asteroid Mining Corporation. Um, I do have quite a strong Scottish accent, so if you do sort of have any issues or have any questions please feel free to sort of clarify anything towards the end. Um, so Asteroid Mining Corporation, Asteroid Mining. Um, so the Asteroid Mining or the series or the name of this talk is Asteroid Mining. Is it the answer to the terrestrial sustainability crisis? And I think it is without doubt but I also think that that's not strong enough when it comes to just how potentially valuable asteroid mining is to humanity. So over the next 25 minutes, I would like to present the argument that asteroid mining is the single greatest economic opportunity in human history, um, which is a bold claim. I make no illusions about that, but with a bit of um, demonstration over the next 25 minutes, I hope that you will come to agree with me on this claim. So we're gonna go way back to the 1700s here to have the very kind of genesis of asteroid mining. Um, asteroid mining is born out of Malthusian theory. Um, it's born out of my international relations dissertation when Malthusian theory and sort of 1700s historical analysis seem to be very much current. And I mean, I've put the Malthusian growth model as a, a bar chart here, but as you can see, I've crossed out food production because the physical parameters of that graph are accurate no matter what the production is because we live on a planet which is inherently finite and I think that is the most important thing to get across in the very early stages of this talk. Our planet is limited in its scope for providing us as a species. It is one planet, it's 
okay, for all extents and purposes, to our mind, it's quite a big planet. It takes you a couple of days to fly around it, but it's not unlimited. The Earth is not infinite, and the resources that we use are being expended. We are using these resources, and for the most part, a lot of the time, we are not even recycling the resources that we use that go into landfill. They get lost. So Thomas Malthus was a, a preacher and an intellectual in the 1700s, and Malthusian theory was the concept that there was only so much land for growing crops, and that if you could only grow so many crops, you could only feed so many people, and at a certain point you would reach a Malthusian catastrophe, where the population had expanded beyond the land's capacity to feed that population, and then famine and starvation would inevitably occur. But we find ourselves in a very similar situation in the 2020s, not when it comes to food production, because thanks to mechanised agriculture, that's something which we don't particularly need to worry about. But the fact that I'm speaking through a Zoom call right now, the fact that I am remotely speaking to several dozen people is a testament to the fact that our entire global society and our global economy is dependent on particular minerals. And these minerals are inherent within our electronics. I mean, almost everyone who will watch this will own or possess a smartphone or have access to a smartphone. And that smartphone contains precious metals. And those precious metals have to come from somewhere. They have to come from out the ground. And uh, they are inherently limited in scope. So perpetual economic growth is impossible in a spherical earth. This is the next point that I would like to demonstrate. As you can see, you've got a, a lovely picture here from Apollo 8 of the pale blue dot. The earth as a sphere, or not quite a sphere because it's sort of half occluded by the moon. But what you can see is that the earth is actually quite a small area. It's quite a small sort of breeding ground for humanity. It's a small biosphere. And then as soon as you get beyond the atmosphere, there is essentially an infinite void of vacuum emptiness, which is quite intimidating. It's quite scary to think that the universe is, okay, it has an end, but it's well beyond our levels of comprehension to imagine and perceive that end. So to all extents and purposes, for our, from our perspective as humans in the 2020s, there is an economic opportunity which exists beyond our planet because our society, our entire economic model is based upon the idea that growth will sustain perpetually. And this just isn't the case when you have a spherical world. The planet is finite. We cannot grow beyond the planet without leaving the planet. And if you can look at this nice, definitely, um, this image of, or this representation of the inner core of the Earth, one of the things which is most important from a space resources perspective is precious metals. And for precious metals, because these are very dense, heavy elements, they tend to sink into the inner crust of the Earth and the mantle. So we find ourselves in a position where it's quite difficult. We know these resources are abundant on Earth, but we can't access them. We can't mine that far down. It's impossible for us to reach the vast bounty of minerals that our planet can provide for us. But thankfully, there is another way, and that way is to look up instead of down. We are, instead of trying to mine 20, 30, 40 kilometres down, we're going to look 40,000, 40 million kilometres up and look to see what is above us, because we have the technological capacity to do that now. And this puts us at a very interesting point in history. So this is a very, very famous photograph. I'm sure you all know it. This is the pale blue dot. This is Earth floating in an endless sea. And this was taken by the Voyager 1 program, uh, the Voyager 1 probe at a distance of 6 billion kilometers from the sun. So this is basically at the very edge of our solar system looking in. The sun would be to your left, deflecting 
the, the, the earth is reflecting towards you. What you're seeing is the earth is a very small, very insignificant part of a solar system. And that solar system is a very small, very insignificant part of a wider galaxy. And that galaxy is a very small and insignificant part of a wider universe. So we are very small. We, as humans, have inherent natural pretensions to greatness. It's why we have emperors, it's why we have monarchies, it's, it's in our blood. But we aren't all that. We're a very small, very insignificant speck on the galactic plane, let alone going any further. So I think it's very important to have this kind of self-awareness of just how small the Earth, because everyone here reads the news, everyone here is caught up in the current pandemic crisis and everything that goes along Trump and everything that happens in life, which is so scary and intimidating. But it's important to remember that this is all very insignificant in a bigger sense. Which leads me to one of my major points of this whole talk. The Earth's resources are finite, but society's demand for these resources are infinite. Space's resources will allow for centuries of economic growth because the sky is not the limit. Our planet is not just sustained upon our planet. We are at a point in history where we have the technological capacity to leave our planet, to go elsewhere, to explore new opportunities, new horizons. And I believe that this is very much a case of what we will and should and must be doing as a species for survival. Because as Tosiovsky said, who was the godfather of Soviet cosmonautics, the earth is but the cradle of society, but we cannot stay in the cradle forever. There is a big wide solar system out there with lots of economic opportunity, lots of opportunities for growth, for expansion, for new frontiers, a shot in the arm for prosperity. And someone needs to go and extract that wealth. So when we look at asteroids in particular, and this is kind of starting to bring it more towards asteroid mining cooperation and what we do as a company, there are a lot of asteroids in the solar system. There are 1.5 million asteroids with in the main belt which have a diameter of more than one kilometer. And of the near Earth asteroids, we know that there are at least 18,000 near Earth asteroids, which are, as you can see by this nice animation, asteroids which are orbiting in the general vicinity of Earth. So there are lots of asteroids. The, and I think it's quite difficult. I mean, I do this every day, so it's less difficult for me, but for a layman to conceptualize and to imagine an asteroid, what is an asteroid? How can you possibly conceptualize a ball of rock floating millions of miles away? Um, what I would say is to imagine a mountain. Imagine something the size of Ben Nevis, something the size of Everest floating in space. It's filled with rock, it's filled with metals, materials, resources, and it just happens to be floating in the inner solar system. And the reason for that is obviously because many asteroids are sort of, and particularly metallic asteroids, I should preface this with, are the early building blocks of the solar system. When our solar system is forming, when the planets were forming, the gravitational pull of these objects pull many asteroids, much solar system debris into anywhere it could find into sort of gravitational hotspots. And in our case, we are very fortunate that many asteroids did not gravitationally attach to other objects. These celestial objects are floating free of any particular sort of gravitational influence apart from the sun, which means that they have very, very low gravitational conditions, which is only affected by the mass of these objects. And they're not gravitationally bound to anything except the sun, which means in some cases they are particularly easy or particularly difficult to access. So now that we know what asteroids are, now, we, now that we know where they are, I think it's important to conduct a small economic analysis of asteroid compositions. And to do that, there's basically three letters that you should know, you should understand. There are three main classifications of asteroids. 
you have your C-type carbonaceous asteroids, which are, as indicated, predominantly carbon-based. Um, you will find some water, some rock, but predominantly carbon-based asteroids, carbonaceous asteroids, um, and water ice, hydroxyl, these can all be found in situ on these, on these objects. Beyond that, you also have silicaceous asteroids, your S-type stony silicaceous asteroids, which, as the name indicates, they are particularly stony, and they're a bit more rocky, and they are slightly more sort of porous. Um, you still can contain some water content, but they are less likely to contain metal content. And then perhaps the most important asteroids from a, an economic perspective are the metallic asteroids, because it is truly the metallic asteroids which are going to revolutionise our global economy over the next decades. So metallic asteroids, now hold my lovely meteorite up here, are predominantly nickel iron. So you're talking 90% nickel iron clusters and then 10% precious metals, cobalt, whatever building blocks of the solar system are left in there. Um, we tend to look from an, an economic perspective and tend to basically see the iron and nickel as waste products of precious metals mining. But that is not to say that these materials are not economically valuable. In fact, iron and nickel are the main ingredients of steel. And if you can have a thousand tons of steel at a low Earth orbit, then you can 3D print a new space station. If you can have a thousand tons of steel on the moon, then there's a moon base right there. So it's quite difficult because we're in a position where we know that the prevailing trend is towards space exploration, towards economic utilisation of space resources, space colonisation, some might say. But we are quite restrained in extolling the virtues of what are essentially worthless materials, because these aren't what we're going after. What we are going after as an asteroid mining company is precious metals. And the reason for that will be quite clear when you see this table here. So I'm going to give you perhaps the most important fact of this entire lecture. A single one kilometre diameter, upper 90th percentile, platinum bearing metallic asteroid contains metals equivalent to three times the gross domestic product of the UK. Which means that your one kilometre diameter, upper 90th percentile, platinum bearing asteroid is worth 9.112 or 9.113 trillion pounds, which is a lot of money. You can do quite a lot with a few trillion if you're willing to sit and consider the tax revenues alone of that amount of money. Then you can you can imagine things like universal basic income, for low payments, um, an advancement of the welfare state free education, free healthcare, all these things become possible when you have an economic incentive behind them. And like resource-rich economies that are the world over, the first countries which mine asteroids will be able to reap the benefits of asteroid mining through sovereign wealth funds. One need only look at Norway and it's one trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund and the societal benefits that that has brought to the Norwegian population to see what being first in the queue for resource rights is worth. And just to kind of break down that one kilometre diameter metallic asteroid, and I should say that this is very much based upon known um, diameters. So parameters, what we are looking at is meteoric samples. We are cross-referencing asteroids which we can't touch with meteor examples which we can gain access to and we can touch, we can spectrochemically analyse. And I think it's important to say that some meteorites are completely worthless and some asteroids are completely worthless, we'll never go there, we'll never bother. But some asteroids are very, very, very valuable and some meteorites are very, very, very valuable. And just kind of break down these figures slightly more. We always look at platinum as our most important resource because it's something which everybody has a conceptualization of. Platinum is inherent in our society. 
we use 25% of the Earth's annual platinum supply, which is 45 tonnes goes into smartphone production alone. We are in a position where so much activity and so much exercise goes into developing platinum group metals that we find ourselves in a position where we are doing unspeakable damage to our planet. And I think this is something which needs to be addressed within the coming years. Otherwise, this may prove fatal to our species. The damage we are doing to our planet right now is unsustainable. We are mining in the Arctic. We are mining under the sea. We are potentially, in the next 30 years, looking at getting mining concessions for Antarctica. We are mining in the rainforests. There is very few places on this planet where the resource extraction industry has not identified resource deposits and has not actioned them, which is problematic for many reasons, but perhaps the most important reason, the most critical reason for anybody is the fact that these resources are finite and the damage which these companies are doing to our planet is potentially irreversible. If you are mining subsurface sea mining, what damage is that doing to the ecosystems under the sea? What damage is that doing to coral plantations? These are questions that we can't answer right now and would take potentially decades to fully answer. Decades in which these companies will still be doing this activity. This damage will still be happening to our planet. But in space, we are outside the Earth's biosphere. We are outside the fragile ecosystem which we all live in and which we all depend on. Asteroids are dead rocks. And as you can see by this image I've just put on the screen, this is asteroid Ryugu, which Hayabusa 2, the Japanese Space Agency, have recently visited. And as you can see, Hayabusa 2 is um, reflected by the sunlight onto the asteroid. You can see its shadow there. And this asteroid is a silicaceous or carbonaceous asteroid, I can't remember exactly, but it is an asteroid which is not metallic, so it's not particularly interesting to us from an economic perspective, although it may contain some water content, which would be sort of interesting in the medium term. But what Hayabusa 2 and Hayabusa 1 and several other missions like the Rosetta probe by the European Space Agency to Comet 67P have demonstrated is that we have the technological capacity to rendezvous with small bodies in our solar system, recover a sample and then take off again. So here is a ground image of Ryugu. So this is what an asteroid would look like if you were standing staring at it from a distance of a few metres away. It's very rocky, it's very desolate, it's very grey, there's not much going on in there. Now compare that to the rainforest, compare that to a coral plantation. There is, I can almost certainly guarantee, I don't want to fully put all my money on it until we're completely certain, but 99.99% sure that there is no life on that body. Nothing lives there. It is dead rock floating in an endless vacuum, which means from our perspective, as a global society, that going there and the covering material is not going to damage our planet. The only damage which comes from asteroid mining is getting out of the atmosphere and the production well on Earth. Once you have escaped our atmosphere, once you've escaped the gravity well, the solar system belongs to us. And this was a video which might work, might not, probably not. Oh, here we go. It actually will work. We'll see. So this is, if it works, um, Hayabusa 2 taking a sample of asteroid Ryugu. It's probably not going to work now, isn't it? But um, if it does work, then you'll see one of the most close-up images of an asteroid. Oh, here we go. Surprised myself. If this loads, I'll be quite impressed. So this is Asteroid Ryugu, this is Hayabusa 2, and Hayabusa 2, if this video will decide to load, thanks to the problems of modern technology, which it is doing, then it is descending onto the asteroid surface with its probing arm. 
it is about to take a very, very small sample, as you can see. There we go, very, very close now. It fired a bullet into the, the asteroid, and now it is by force of propellant mechanisms being forced up away from the asteroid. So the dynamics of that, a very, very small force in the microgravity conditions has pushed that entire spacecraft away from that object, but not before the covering a small sample, which in our perspective is very important because this is a proof of concept for an asteroid mining mission. And now that we know that asteroid mining is potentially viable, then there comes the question, what is the legality of it? How would you allocate space to resource property rights? And as you can see by the lovely image I have placed there, this is the United States Space Force, the newest branch of the US military and arguably the hottest trend in geopolitics. Space resource rights, property rights, allocations, these are all very much hot topics from the legal and policy worlds. There have been very, very few discussions over the past 50 years about how a private company, a government, a private individual would actually be able to go in the cover material from an asteroid. But we're at a very interesting point in history where this has suddenly became reality. Um, when I started Asteroid Mining Cooperation four years ago, I was hoping that this would happen, but it's, um, it's definitely went slightly better than I possibly could have even hoped for. Because now we are in a position where the United States government has fully advocated a policy approach for space resources, lunar mining, and exploration of the outer solar and the inner and outer solar system. And perhaps most importantly, these are dubbed the Artemis Accords, which could be, there are still particular questions on whether or not this is going to be bilateral agreements, which directly affect the United States, or whether this is going to ultimately become a, a multilateral beneficial treaty to the entire planet. But the Artemis Accords look to be the single greatest recognition of property rights in outer space, which means that the Wild West is here, or the Wild Up is here, it might be even better to say. But because the Artemis Accords are very much focused on unilateralism and bilateralism, it's important to always advocate a multilateralist approach. We are a global society, we are a global commonwealth of nations. We do not want any country to have an undue advantage or an undue disadvantage as a result of space resources. In fact, we're obligated under the Outer Space Treaty to avoid such occurrences. So this is where the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group comes in. Uh, so the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group has developed the building blocks for the development of an international framework on space resource activities which is a framework, as can be seen, but is also the very basis of multilateralism in space resources. This is an expert-led group, of which I'm very proud to have been a member, with partners from across the entire global space resources industry. And what the ultimate goal of the Hague Space Resources Governance Working Group was to develop a, a talking shop we wanted to have a conception of what our future space resources legislation and governance would look like. And more than any other organisation, more than any other position, our governance group, the Hague Working Group, has provided a set of global governance rules. So I would advocate anyone who is interested in a legal and policy side of space resources to go and look at the Hague building blocks, to go and lead the Hague working group commentary, because the discussions that are sort of highlighted there are very much the essence of the space mining industry, the space resources industry. Does space belong to everybody? Does it belong to those who get there? These are the kind of questions which have and will be answered going forward. But we find ourselves in 2020 in a position 
If space resources and asteroid mining looks to be legal, how would we go about doing it? Because it's, it's not easy. Like it's it's not something you can just come up with. But, but we'll see. But that's where we come in. Me and my team, Asteroid Mining Corporation. We are the UK's pioneering space resources business. We are established in 2016 in my university bedroom in 70 Langdale Road, Liverpool. Um, in fact, I hadn't actually finished my international relations dissertation. I barely started writing it when I founded the company because I realised what an economic opportunity asteroid mining was. I realised what a disruptive opportunity asteroid mining was because there are very, very few things in human history which are bigger than the planet. But asteroid mining is one of those things. And there's um, essentially two quotes that we like to use. So imagine a future where we can use the resources of the many worlds beyond Earth and work as if you live in the first days of a better world. These are the mottos of the Asteroid Mining Corporation. We like to believe that the world is getting better. No matter what the world likes to throw at us, we believe that things are inherently improving. Society is in a gradual upward path and we believe it's our duty to help that path by providing a new economic opportunity and a new platform for growth for the planet. So to break down a little bit of what we do as a company, because asteroid mining is a very lofty goal, it's a very highfalutin, distant ambition and there have been asteroid mining businesses in the past and they have failed. So what makes us different? The answer is quite simple and perhaps one which possibly should have been answered in the past. We know asteroids are valuable. We know asteroids are potentially very lucrative and economically disruptive to our planet. But we don't actually know very much about asteroids, which sounds like quite sort of contrary to what you'd imagine. But our compositional knowledge of asteroids, the particularly important bit, is surprisingly limited. We know a lot about asteroids locations. There's been sort of many years, decades of things like Space Guard, um, NEO Watch, looking at the solar system, looking at near-Earth asteroids, looking at potentially hazardous asteroid objects and seeing if anything is going to hit the Earth. That's quite well established. So we know where these asteroids are, but what we don't know is particularly well. We know for some asteroids, but what we don't know for the majority of asteroids is what are they actually made of? What are they composed of? How do they relate to one another? These questions can be solved by using a ground-based telescope. And they have been solved in the past by using ground-based telescopes. We've conducted surveys on several thousand asteroids on their compositions. We've taken spectra. We understand the, the spectral classification, the composition of these objects. But what we don't know is where they are, what they're worth, how do we get there? And because the data available through ground-based telescopes is so limited for various reasons, I mean, the fact that a ground-based telescope is limited to the night, for example, does cause problems. There's, in summer in Scotland, about 18 hours of daylight and six hours of nighttime, which means that your observation schedule is very limited. And to be able to even justifiably categorise one of these asteroids spectrally, you need a two metre diameter telescope, which is approximately £10,000 per night to rent, which is very, very high and arguably unsustainable for many universities and academics. So that's our problem. How do we solve these problems? Here's a solution, and this is where we come in as a company. This is where we're quite proud of our solution, in fact. The Asteroid Prospecting Satellite 1. We will launch uh, 12 U CubeSat, so something about the size of two CD boxes end to end. And this CubeSat will look out into the solar system. It will be in a 800 kilometre sun synchronous orbit. So the sun is always behind this satellite. And with APS-1, the Asteroid Prospecting Satellite 1, 
what we will do is we will look out into the solar system. We will look at asteroids. We reasonably estimate that we will be able to categorise 10,000 asteroids per night, uh, per year, sorry. Um, so of 10,000 asteroids per year, it's significantly more asteroids than has ever been categorised. And over the space of a five to 10 year mission duration, our, our orbital duration is nine years. So realistically, we're looking at five, seven, potentially eight years at a push with nominal satellite function. What we'd be looking at is anywhere in the region of 50 to 100,000 asteroids being categorised. So we know where these asteroids are. We've catalogued catalog them. We know where they are. The lack of compositional data, the lack of knowledge on these asteroids is really holding us back as a society in our expansion into the solar system. As soon as we know what these asteroids are worth, where they are, what they contain, then we can start planning space resources missions. It's our opinion at AMC, and you may disagree with this, you may agree, but it's our opinion that the lack of data is the single largest barrier to the development of the space resources sector globally. With accurate empirical data on space resources, then a global boom in space commodities will begin and untold economic benefits will occur as a result of that. So this is how we propose to do this. Asteroid mining is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a few years, let's put it mildly. So there's a three-phased approach to asteroid mining. We have prospecting, exploration, and exploitation. So prospecting, as I've described previously, is with the asteroid prospecting satellite one. We had hoped to launch next year, but coronavirus has put us back at least a year or two. So we are now aiming to have APS-1 fully operational in orbit by 2023. And obviously, as soon as that is developed, then we can start integrating that data into a commercial service, which we call the Space Resources Database, which will be available to academia, governments and industry, financiers, anyone with a particular interest in understanding what economic opportunities exist beyond our planet is welcome to by access to our data set. And then once we have established that data set, and once we understand which asteroids are the most viable candidates for asteroid mining, that leads us down a path because we've developed an algorithm which will take that prospecting data, it will take the astrodynamic and the compositional data of these asteroids, and it will process that and it will fire out at the other side of this algorithm a list of the most valuable, viable asteroids in our solar system. These asteroids are untold treasures. I mean, the Spanish went to the New World in search of gold. The Dutch went to the East Indies in search of spices. The British went to India in search of spices and gold. None of those economic shifts in history would be even comparable to a single asteroid being mined. Because if you can imagine the richest mine on Earth floating in a free vacuum with very limited gravity, then it becomes very easy to recover material from that object if you can get spacecraft up there. And obviously, we are living in a very, very good time for space exploration. There are a plethora of launch providers, there's a plethora of launch options. Spacecraft have gone deeper and further into the solar system beyond than we could have possibly imagined a generation ago. So we find ourselves at a very interesting point in human history where we almost have the technological capacity to mine asteroids, to conduct lunar exploration and essentially move the source exploration off our planet. So what would that look like? This might take a minute to load, so while this loads, I'll just prosatellize about space mining slightly more. This is the Asteroid Prospecting Satellite 1. This is a, a very, very brief animation. It should only take 20 seconds, but it'll probably take 40 seconds to load. And essentially, 
the idea here is to give you a visual conception. That is a 12 view CubeSat, uh, and it's probably not going to work. There we go, it does work. There we go, 12 view CubeSat in orbit of the Earth, looks out towards an asteroid, and just looks. It takes the sunlight off of that asteroid, fracks it into our spacecraft, and then we can analyse that light and we can understand the resources within that asteroid and we can find particular materials. For example, platinum can be found between 0 0.5 and 0, 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 microns as a spike in the spectral chart, which means that it becomes very easy to detect particular minerals. It becomes very easy to search algorithmically with deep learning for particular resources, which obviously makes everything slightly easier from a a mining perspective. Now, this is what mining would look like. This would definitely take a little bit longer to load, but this is what a decade or so from now, the first mining missions would look like. And to get to a mining mission, you probably need an exploration mission, which at this stage, because we're agnostic, a mining and exploration mission might look very similar. The goal is to recover a small amount of material an exploration mission and a mining mission are probably only differentiated in the fact that the mining mission is looking to turn a profit, whereas an exploration mission does not preface any exploration by turning a profit. But how would either of these mission classes work? Well, you would send a spacecraft from the Earth, you would use the data set that we've developed to identify your asteroid, which is the most valuable, the most valuable candidate you would send the spacecraft to the asteroid. You would go close to the asteroid. You would enter the asteroid's orbit. Once you've orbited that asteroid, you can create a global surface map of its mineralogy, molecular and metallurgical components. And then once you have that, you have your landing sites. Once you land in the asteroid, you can then take a subsurface sample. And drilling technology for asteroid mining already exists within the University of Glasgow. The surface compositional analysis tools already exist within the University of Stirling, which would suggest that the UK, perhaps more than any other country, is one of the true potential heavyweights of the space mining industry. And then once you've recovered a small sample from an asteroid, your sample return capsule separates and it enters through the Earth's atmosphere. So, as a conceptualization. And how do we as a company make money? We make money through the Space Resources database. Our goal is to be a marketplace, a network provider for the global space resources sector. When we say that we are an asteroid mining company, that does not mean that we expect to be the ones to mine asteroids. In fact, we would be quite shocked if we were. What we envisage doing as a company is extolling the virtues of asteroid mining, extolling the economic opportunity, because mining companies regularly put billions into open cast pit mines on this planet. Several billion would be more than enough to establish a economically viable space mining capability, which is where we come in. We identify the asteroids which are the most valuable, and then we sell this data to clients, to partners, and we look for strategic partnerships and how we as a company guarantee our long-term survival in a cutthroat marketplace is by following long established market conditions in the terrestrial mining exploration industry. There is in terrestrial mining exploration a concept known as net smelter return where the junior partner in a partnership, the, the mining exploration company, will go and will explore the resources of a particular area. They will perhaps own exclusive licenses over that area. And then once they have those licenses and that exclusive knowledge, they will then look to sell that to a much larger company. One of your tier one mining operators, your London Stock Exchange listed companies. So what do we do as a company? What are our services? How do we monetize the concept of what we're doing. It's relatively straightforward, at least initially, with Astro Prospecting Satellite 1. We will 
establish a database on asteroids, we will establish an asteroid movement schedule. So we essentially look to map the resources of the solar system with a, an up-to-date real-time map of what's where and what it contains. And then the material composition of asteroids is perhaps the most lucrative and important information that we can ever generate. And that's what we're ultimately looking to do over the next two to three years. And then obviously there's benefits to academia, government industry, and the mining industry in particular as a result of that, which is from academia, access to thousands of mapped asteroids, the compositions of asteroids, what they contain, what the economic benefits of this are, economic analysis tools, purely compositional scientific tools. There's a lot of data to be generated on asteroids and academics who are interested can have first refusal on processing and analysing and writing papers about that data because there's so much of it that it's going to take years to get through. And then from a government industry perspective, the data on asteroids for economic modelling and mission launch planning is very, very important. The country which launches an asteroid mining mission first will likely be the first country with a $10 trillion sovereign wealth fund. We're looking at the potential for huge economically disruptive prosperity because we, we live in very, very interesting times with coronavirus. All you see in the economic papers and financial papers is doom, gloom, recession, depression, Great Depression, biggest drop in centuries. And I think it's our job to present an, an alternative. Asteroids are the shot in the arm for prosperity that we need right now. Thousands, millions of people have lost their jobs. The economy will be in a bad way for a while. But the economies which are the strongest are the economies which are backed by resources and based upon resources. Historically, resource-backed economies have always performed stronger than any others. So what we are offering is the opportunity for new governments and new interests to be formed around potentially the most lucrative resources ever discovered. So this brings me to my final point and the conclusion of my talk and it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you all but what we've been doing at asteroid mining corporation does not exist in a vacuum there is a, a global space resources industry a global one i mean i can just off the top of my head think of partners from poland holland luxembourg the us canada japan australia germany there are a global network of countries with interest in space resources and we would look to support and advocate for this as much as possible which is why we have taken the step of establishing a space resources development council which is an independent body from asteroid mining corporation um, i am general secretary i am not president i am not the person who ultimately has authority over this. I believe that independence is important here. What we are looking to do with the Space Resources Development Council is to establish a forum for academics, industry, governmental types to discuss. Because when the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group where business was concluded, there suddenly found itself to be a lack in forums and discussion about space resources and we are at the most critical and important time for space resources potentially ever if not in our lifetimes and the history of the entire concept so it's important to keep momentum going which is why we are now looking with the space resources development council and i'm wearing a completely different hat here to my asteroid mining corporation hat here the space resources development council is open to all there are trustees, there is invited members, and then observers are open to anybody who wishes to have an interest in the space resources sector. Anybody who thinks their research might be applicable, anybody who just even has the faintest interest in space resources is welcome to join the Space Resources Development Council. What we want to do is to establish a global forum 
a global council for discussion, for advocacy, and for the ultimate betterment of our human species, because we are all in this together. None of us will get off this planet, but we can make this planet better while we're all here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at CEO at astrodmeningcorporation.co.uk or I'm more than available to answer any of the questions right now. Thank you very much.